Welcome to the Watchman Channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963 thank you all so much for your prayers and support god bless jesus said as a sign of his coming and the end of the age there would be an increase in deception false christ who will deceive many wars and rumors of wars nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom famines pestilences earthquakes christian persecution apostasy false prophets and lawlessness causing the love of many to grow cold jesus said all of these signs would come like birth pains jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor as the labor progresses the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes as we get closer to jesus return all the signs he gave us as a sign of his coming and the end of the age will become more frequent and more intense all of these signs are manifesting around the world in our time Hosea 4.6 My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I also will reject you from being priest for me. Because you have forgotten the law of your God, I also will forget your children. In the last days, just prior to Jesus' return, the Bible tells us there will be a falling away from the Christian faith, as we read in 2 Thessalonians 2, 1-4. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, speaking of the rapture, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ, speaking of the tribulation, had come. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day the tribulation will not come unless the falling away, the apostasy, comes first, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who is the Antichrist, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God, in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Second Thessalonians 2, 1-4 tells us, First, the rapture will take place. Then after the rapture comes the seven-year tribulation, and that the falling away from the Christian faith and the revealing of the Antichrist will take place before the tribulation begins. Clearly, the Antichrist has not yet taken his place on the world scene. But we are most definitely seeing the falling away from the Christian faith. A new survey revealing more Americans than ever are not affiliated with religion, and those leading the jump are younger Gen X and older millennials, with nearly 50% no longer feeling tied to any religion at all. So why the shift? Let's talk about it. Why do you think this trend is happening? What, what are young people thinking? I think what it really comes down to is Gen Z is desperately searching for something authentic. We've grown up in this fabricated world of social media. We've constantly been thrown, you know, this information in, in these filtered, these filtered, you know, um, ideas of what of what truth is, but we're really searching for something real. We're really searching for something authentic, and we can't find that in relationship. I mean, we can't find that in religion. We can only find that in relationship. So, what we're searching for isn't religion, but what we're searching for is relationship. Well, I have to believe that the decrease in the trust in institutions also has a lot to do with that. But let's talk about what happened. Look at these numbers here. Um, so you have. There's a 4% increase in unaffiliated Gen Z or 7% increase in religiously unidentified boomers. Um, you, so you have those numbers. We also have um, the unaffiliated um, among political parties. So 33% of Democrats are unaffiliated with any religion. 12% of Republicans are unaffiliated. We're also seeing a decrease even um, you know, in, in people identifying as Christians. So I just want to talk about what happens to the country when less people identify themselves as Christians, when so many of our rights are rooted in Christianity. Um, what does that do to the country? Absolutely, that's a very good question. And like you said, America is a Christian nation. We're founded on Christian morals. So how is America supposed to stand if Americans aren't believing in those same morals? And the truth of the matter is that I know people aren't gonna like me saying this, but without Christians in America taking a stand, without Christians in America being the back bone of this country, America will not stand. We will we will totally falter because we will no longer have a basis of truth. You no, know, there's there's no question about it. I think it absolutely changed our, changes our understanding of where our rights come from, which fundamentally changes the country and many 
um, I think, negative ways. I want to talk a little bit about what you said, how they don't want to go to church. They, they want, they're looking for something more authentic. I think something might get lost in that, uh, Carolyn, in that, you know, so many people get support from having a church community. I mean, I'm so worried about young mm -hmm. people anyway, you know, working from home, remote work, they're, they're not interacting enough, and now they're saying, I can do my own religion thing without a church community. 100%. I mean, we've seen this time and time again, even the government has tried to take the place of churches when really, you know, it's up to the churches to step in and be the community and, and help those and, and give not handouts, but hand ups. And if we don't have the church as the backbone, then we will definitely lose our country. Really fast. What can, what can uh, church leaders do to bring young people back into the pews? We can speak the biblical truth because that is what Gen Z is desperately searching for. We aren't searching for fluff anymore. We're searching for authenticity. We're searching for the word that convicts us, that we know is real, that we know is alive. And we're not going to get that unless our preachers are willing to take a stand and to speak the truth boldly and unapologetically. God has revealed his truth to us through his word, the Bible. Knowing absolute truth is only possible through a personal relationship with the one who claims to be the truth. Jesus Christ. Jesus is the only way, the only truth, the only life, and the only path to God. The fact that absolute truth does exist points us to the truth that there is a sovereign God who created the heavens and the earth and who has revealed himself to mankind in order that we might know him personally through his son, Jesus Christ. That is the absolute truth. In the last days, the prophet Zechariah tells us Israel will be the focal point of world conflict and he gives a dire warning to the nations who would dare come against Jerusalem. Zechariah 12, 2 and 3 Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of drunkenness to all the surrounding peoples when they lay siege against Judah and Jerusalem. And it shall happen in that day that I will make Jerusalem a very heavy stone for all peoples. All who would heave it away will surely be cut in pieces, though all nations of the earth are gathered against it. This prophecy is unfolding right before our very eyes. Overseas in the Middle East, Secretary of State Anthony Blinken landed in the region overnight in the aftermath of the deadly attack in Lebanon. Thousands of patriots belonging to members of Hezbollah exploded across the country. It was an Israeli operation. The region is now braced for response. The death toll is rising this morning in Lebanon in this unprecedented, incredibly sophisticated attack. And this morning, Hezbollah vowing revenge against Israel. This morning, Hezbollah stunned and crippled by this brazen, highly coordinated attack. Thousands of wireless pagers, which Hezbollah uses to communicate and carry out its own attacks, simultaneously exploding across Lebanon. Operatives reportedly hearing a beeping sound, expecting a message, and instead the pagers blowing up in hands, in front of faces, and here you see in a grocery store. Photos circulating on social media appear to show the remains of a pager model used in the attack. Graphic images circulating online showing fingers blown off, bloodied faces, and damaged eyes. Bystanders rushing to help the injured, blood spilled in the streets, hospitals overwhelmed. At least 2,800 were wounded, many critically, close to a dozen killed, including a child, according to the Lebanese. Iran's ambassador to Lebanon also wounded. Our Marcus Moore is on the ground in Lebanon. We are just outside American University Hospital in Beirut. The relatives of the injured gathering out front. Doctors saying that they have suffered serious burns, amputations, and also facial injuries. And Hezbollah now vowing to retaliate. Israel has not commented, but sources tell ABC News that Israel embedded explosives in the pagers, which were then sold to Hezbollah. A U.S. intelligence source tells ABC News that Israel has long been working to perfect what's called a supply chain interdiction attack. Hezbollah leadership had warned members months ago to stop using mobile phones, fearing they had been compromised. So pagers were then ordered. According to the U.S. source, Israeli shipments would have been intercepted with a small amount of explosive and detonators inserted into the devices before being delivered. What seems to be a very sophisticated operation by the Israelis 
actually worked by using lower technology, the pagers that they used to implant with explosives that would have detonated on all of the Hezbollah operators who were affected. This comes as Israel and Hezbollah exchange missile and rocket fire along the Lebanese border, with Israel warning the military campaign will ramp up and Hezbollah this morning saying a reckoning will come. And this morning, U.S. officials have no doubt that Hezbollah will take revenge here in Israel, but Hezbollah is reeling from the widespread attack, losing communications and leaving thousands of operatives wounded and some dead, so it may take some time for a response. The Bible tells us there are four possible prophecies on the verge of finding fulfillment. Isaiah 17:1, in which Damascus, Syria, will be destroyed in a single night. Jeremiah 49, the prophecy of Alam which could infer an Israeli attack upon Iran's nuclear program. Psalm 83, in which the Muslim nations that border Israel will mount an attack on Israel in order to cut them off from being a nation. Ezekiel 38 and 39, known as the War of Gog and Magog. In this prophecy, a coalition of nations led by Russia, Iran, and Turkey will attack Israel in the last days in order to take Israel's wealth. As a sign of his coming and the end of the age, Jesus declares, And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars, See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet, for a nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. I want to get your take on, on, a, on an even bigger issue here, potentially, and that is what's happening in foreign affairs in this country relative to the rest of the world, particularly our ad uh, adversaries. Vladimir Putin ordered the Russian army to become the second largest army in the world, only after China's which is 1.5 million strong. Uh, when I, I mean military, not just army. China and Russia holding the largest war game since the Soviet era, wrapping up a week of joint air and naval drills. The Russian Defense Ministry confirming another joint training operation will begin, including 90,000 troops, 400 warships and submarines, 120 aircraft across multiple oceans. The State Department sounding the alarm on Chinese support for Russia, saying Beijing has crossed a line, providing, quote, very substantial support to replenish the Kremlin's military stockpiles. Xi Jinping confirmed he is visiting Russia next month for the BRICS economic summit. This is his second visit since Russia invaded Ukraine. General, how, I mean, how nervous or scared should we be by the fact that China and Russia have serious plans, okay? Russia says it wants to be the largest military behind China's. Now, we know that the U.S. is the largest military, but China is, is investing big time, as you've made the point many times. Oh, yeah, absolutely. The Congressional Commission and I was on for 20 months, bipartisan, delivered a report a few weeks ago that laid this out in some degree of detail. And, and the fact is that China, Russia, Iran and North Korea collectively are presenting the most significant threat to the United States since we have faced in World War II. That's a heck of a statement to be making. Unbelievable. And we believe we have the evidence to back it up. And here you're just displaying more of the evidence. They are dead serious. They have become more aggressive in the last three or four years. And why is that? Because they believe the United States is politically weak and can be taken advantage of. And they're seeking opportunity right. here. This exercise is obviously helping to train them in how they would actually fight together. But it's also sending a loud message to our allies and partners in the region that they are going to impose their will. And they have been doing that in the Indo-Pacific right. region. Obviously, Putin is doing it in Europe. Iran is doing it in the Middle East. We got to wake up. This is dead serious. This is a dangerous threat. It's real, and it's out there, and they're coming for us. And yeah. we've got to make certain that we're confronting them. And what do we do? We have defense budgets that are flatlined for inflation. Does that make any sense when we're right. so far behind in our capacity matched against theirs? It makes no sense. And the administration will not tell the American people how serious this threat really is. A Ukrainian drone strike destroyed a Russian weapons warehouse in the Tver region. A source in Ukraine's SBU state security service told Reuters on Wednesday. This unverified footage shows a huge ball of flames blasting into the sky and multiple detonations. The source said the warehouse in the town of Toropets contained weapons intended for tactical missile systems as well as guided aerial bombs and artillery ammunition and that a fire from the blast took hold of a nearly four mile wide area. 
The Ukraine SBU source said it was part of reducing the enemy's missile potential, which it uses to destroy Ukrainian cities. War bloggers and media reported earlier on Wednesday the attack, over 200 miles west of Moscow, was near the site of a large Russian arsenal. NASA satellites picked up intense heat sources emanating from an area of about five square miles at the site in the early hours. And earthquake monitoring stations picked up what sensors thought was a small earthquake in the area. John 15, 18 through 20. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. Just when you thought that the rainbow tyrants couldn't get any worse, Imagine being an upstanding citizen with a heart of gold, willing to foster a child in need, but be told by the state that you must submit to their far-left ideology on gender and sex or lose your license. That's happening in nutty Vermont. Brian and Katie Wadi are devout Christians who won't play along with the far-left rules, and so they're suing Vermont, and good for them. And they're being helped by Katie Anderson, the senior counsel for Alliance Defending Freedom, and they join me now. So, Brian and Katie, first of all, thank you for doing what you're doing for kids uh, in need, and, and it's admirable, and the fact that Vermont is giving you problems is crazy, but they admit that they have a big need for foster families, and yet they're willing to prevent you from being one, so tell us your story. Yeah, so we started fostering in 2014. Uh, two of our five children we've adopted through the Department of Children and Families, and our license was revoked a little over two years ago uh, because we were unable to speak against or act against our religious faith, even though we said we would love and accept any child. Katie, uh, you, you must be furious at what the state is doing to one of its own residents. I'm more heartbroken. Um, uh, there have been um, there have been a, a myriad of emotions for sure. Um, we would just love to be able to serve the community in this way that we have been um, in, the, in the last 10 years. Uh, and we would love to be able to get back to that. What are in Vermont's Department of Children and Families licensing rules with regard to the LGBT agenda? I mean, did the state actually say you're not fit to be foster parents because you won't take your, your foster child to a pride parade and things like that? When it had first happened to us, they were just kind of testing the waters with this, with just an email saying, on a scale of one to five, would you be loving and accepting of an LGBT child placed in your home? Uh, but since then, they've uh, pursued more direct policy in which there is expectation of using a, a child's pronouns, even if they don't agree with their, their biological sex or taken into pride parades and things like that. Katie, uh, to me, this seems like a pretty open, shut case of religious discrimination. But unfortunately, there's nothing simple anymore, especially when you're dealing with progressive judges in places like Bur Burlington, Vermont. Well, every child deserves a loving home with a mom and a dad. And the Wadis and the Gants that have joined them in this case have a proven track record with the state of providing a wonderful place for kids in deep need. Um, even after the state kicked the Gants and the Wadis out of uh, the foster and adoption system, they've been sending letters announcing how great their need is for loving homes. So what you have happening is the government in the state of Vermont putting politics and ideology above the best interest of kids, forcing these families to violate their religious beliefs and engage in speech and teaching these kids things that they don't believe are best for these children uh, that are in their care. Uh, and this is something that the state shouldn't do. The state needs to put the interest of kids first and stop discriminating against people based on their religious beliefs. Are there similar cases like this, either in Vermont or around the country? Yes, unfortunately, absolutely, there are more. We have another case in Oregon, we have a case in Washington, and we're hearing from families in the foster and adoption system across the state that more and more states are using this as a tactic to try to prevent loving parents from adopting, from fostering, because the state doesn't agree with their religious beliefs, and that's unconstitutional. Have ju judges ruled on this yet around the country, or mm -hmm. is there case law or no? Uh, the case in Oregon, uh, the judge did rule for the state, saying the state could do this. 
uh, which is very unfortunate. That case has been appealed and was just argued yesterday before the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. So it's gotten to a higher court. We're very hopeful about how that argument went and how that court will rule on this, because it's clear that kids need these homes, that the state can't discriminate against people based on their religious beliefs, and they absolutely shouldn't in this situation. So Brian and Katie, Vermont is trying to force you to choose between your personal beliefs and your religious beliefs, of course, and your conscience versus that of the state, you know, submitting to the will of the state. So that's what it comes down to. Um, and are, are you ready to take this as far as you can? Yeah, this is very important to us. Uh, we do want to make sure that these kids who are in desperate need for a loving home are able to access that. Uh, and we want to make sure that families aren't discriminated against unjustly uh, while they apply for their license. This is very important to our family. Uh, foster care has become a value for us in our church and many churches in our area. And we want to make sure that Christians and other people who might disagree with the state are continue uh, to have access to this license. Matthew 5, 10 through 12. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecute the prophets who were before you. Remember to pray for our persecuted brothers and sisters in Christ. Remember the prisoners as if chained with them, those who are mistreated, since you yourselves are in the body also. Hebrews 13.3, 1 Corinthians 12.26 And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. Or if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. 1 Corinthians 16.13 Watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave, be strong. This morning, the fight for fairness in women's sports as judges in Arizona and New Hampshire rule in favor of biological males pushing to play on female sports teams. Our next guest has been calling out the unfairness since being forced to compete against trans swimmers in college. Host of Gains for Girls podcast on Outkick.com, Riley Gaines joins us now. Two legal victories here in the on the trans athlete side of the equation here. The Ninth Circuit in Arizona um, allows trans athletes and also this court in New Hampshire is going to allow trans athletes for the time being and to continue to compete against girls. Uh, this is pretty heartbreaking news is what it is uh, to see courts, to see judges ruling in favor of males. I mean, women's sports were created on the explicit grounds of being exclusive. And so when we allow males, regardless of how they identify, to compete in women's sports, it undermines everything that women's sports were created to protect and to uphold and to celebrate. The Apostle Peter makes it clear that men are physically stronger and women are the weaker vessel, as we read in 1 Peter 3, 7. Husbands, likewise, dwell with them with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers may not be hindered. Really, they're acting more like activists. If you look at their statements they released, uh, what they are doing is ruling not only uh, in opposition to women, but really in opposition to biological reality. Genesis 127. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. In Psalm 139, we learn that God fashions each one of us. For you form my inward parts. You cover me in my mother's womb. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret, and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Your eyes saw my substance, being yet unformed, and in your book they all were written, the days fashioned for me, when as yet there were none of them. God's creation of each individual must surely include his designation of gender. His wonderful work leaves no room for mistakes. No one is born with the wrong body. Riley has a new uh, special up at Fox Nation. It's called Transfixed. Let's take a quick look at Transfixed. She looked into my eyes and said, you're a boy. This makes sense. You know, it, it's why you want to die and you're miserable and everything will go away when your brain and your body are aligned. Riley, tell us about that clip. That's you, you interviewing, I assume, someone who's begun the process of transition or has transitioned. And tell us about the, the show at large. In that clip, you see me interviewing a young girl who was coerced at a young age to transitioning. 
you know, she got involved in these online communities and, and was manipulated into believing that she was a boy. Began to transition, uh, but ultimately realized one day she still had that maternal instinct. She one day wanted to be a mother, but it was unfortunately almost too late at that point as, as doctors had removed healthy body parts, her breasts. Uh, she began to detransition. Uh, then ultimately she did get pregnant and she gave birth to a beautiful baby boy. But again, um, she doesn't have breasts to breastfeed, but they don't remove the mammary, mammary gland. She's still producing milk. I mean, really, really tragic, horrible, heartbreaking things. But these are the things that the American people, the American voters, your common sense, everyday American who intuitively knows that males and females are different. These are the kind of stories that they need to hear and that they need to see to understand this isn't a solution in search of a problem. This is happening all around us. God gives a dire warning to anyone who would cause a child to sin, as we read in Matthew 18, 6 and 7. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were drowned in the depth of the sea. Woe to the world because of offenses. For offenses must come. But woe to that man by whom the offense comes. Now to the life-threatening flash flooding in the Carolinas. Let's go to Faith Abube at Carolina Beach in North Carolina with the impact of this historic rain. The Carolina Beach area is still under a state of emergency. We're told more than 60 people have been rescued so far, and you can see why. The water is starting to recede, but there are multiple vehicles that are stalled or flooded along this roadway. We are seeing a lot of water still left to go. There are also lawn chairs, picnic tables, garbage bins that have been washed into the roadways. Some of these neighbors had about four feet of water on their property at one point yesterday and now they have a lot of cleanup left to do. This morning, life-threatening flash flooding from a powerful, slow-moving system, dumping more than a foot and a half of rain on parts of the Carolinas. Authorities declaring a state of emergency for Carolina Beach, just south of Wilmington. AccuWeather storm chasers in Southport finding submerged cars and a bridge overwhelmed by surging floodwaters. Oh, my gosh. Oh, this bridge is collapsing right here in this truck. Just... The Jeep just fell into the bridge right here, guys. Across the state, some homeowners like Hunter Varnon stunned by the speed of it all. I've seen a lot of hurricanes, but I've never seen the water stack up this high this fast. We spoke to drivers who've been stuck on Highway 17 for hours, every few minutes running into sections like this that are flooded or flat out impassable. I'm going to try to make it home. I want to do that. There is a house just behind me around the corner where the garage is still flooded this morning. It's going to be interesting to see how the neighbors get out of there. There are also multiple roads across this area that have been closed. Officials say they're still doing damage assessment. In the meantime, though, the National Weather Service says the amount of rain that this area got in just a 12 hour period on average only happens once every 1000 years. Polish Prime Minister Donald Tusk says more than a billion euros of funding will be needed for relief efforts following widespread flooding in Poland. Tusk's call for European aid follows days of heavy rainfall across swathes of Central Europe, which has caused severe flooding in Poland, the Czech Republic, Slovakia, Romania and Austria. At least 18 people have been killed in the floods so far, and evacuations have taken place in Poland, the Czech Republic and Austria. An emergency shelter has been set up in the Tillen Exhibition Hall in Austria, while well, more than 5,000 troops have been deployed to southern Poland to help fortify sandbanks along the Nisa Klodzka River. Flood alert levels remain high in the Czech Republic, although meteorologists expect water levels in southern Bohemian rivers to reduce throughout the day. Slovakia's interior minister says the flood situation there is improving, but attention must now be turned to aftermath relief efforts. Meanwhile, President of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, has called for the solidarity of all of Europe to provide as much support as possible to the countries affected by flooding. As violent winds push trees back and forth, the red glow of flames approaches this patch of forest in Portugal. Firefighters were still battling difficult conditions in the early hours of Wednesday morning, one day after three firefighters died when their truck became trapped by fire in the central region of Coimbra. About 50 kilometers north, these residents in Agueda watched on in disbelief as a blaze ravaged the outskirts of their neighborhood and destroyed a warehouse. I was the owner of the warehouse. 
I had a small construction company. I worked all my life for 65 years, 70 years, and everything is destroyed. By early Wednesday, more than 5,500 firefighters and about 20 aircraft were battling fires located mostly in the country's north. This after authorities had invoked the European Union's civil protection mechanism to obtain additional water bombers. The Portuguese government has extended an alert warning until Thursday evening. Jesus said a sign of his return would be more frequent and more intense weather, as we read in Matthew 24, 7 and 8. And there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. Pestilence is the Greek word loimus, which means a plague. Definition of a plague is any large-scale calamity, especially when thought to be sent by God. God has used plagues in the form of extreme weather in the past and will again in the future. The seventh plague on Egypt was hail. Don't forget about the famine in Joseph's time. One of the biggest is the flood in the book of Genesis. In the future, during the seven-year tribulation, God will once again use extreme weather in the form of pestilence as judgment. In Revelation 16:21, God uses hailstones weighing 100 pounds each, and great hail from heaven fell upon men, each hailstone about the weight of a talent. Men blaspheme God because of the plague of the hail, since that plague was exceedingly great. In Revelation 16:8 8 and 9, God uses scorching heat. Then the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and power was given to him to scorch men with fire, and men were scorched with great heat, and they blasphemed the name of God who has power over these plagues, and they did not repent and give him glory. So when Jesus Christ warns us that just before his second coming, there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places, you had better believe that these occurrences are a sign from God and that he is about to intervene. Psalm 18.7 Then the earth shook and trembled. The foundations of the hills also quaked and were shaken because he was angry. We bring you continuing coverage tonight. Two earthquakes hitting West Texas Monday night, and it was felt by many of you, even if you lived quite far from the epicenter. A lot of people felt the quake, even as far as here in Midland, and a lot of them told me that this earthquake just kind of came out of nowhere. It was just really weird. It, I, it felt like somebody hit my bed. I was in my bed. Somebody hit my bed. I thought the kids were under the bed. They were not. First thing I did was yelled out, Glenn! because the whole house just started to shake. And I was more worried about the china in the house. I was watching the football game and um, my dog and cat were acting a little bit odd and kind of prancing and wanting to go outside. I was at the dinner table with my family and my dad was on the couch and all of a sudden we're talking and it's, we feel something. We all just kind of look around and my dad's like, look at the lights, and our little bar lights. They were swinging back and forth because we didn't really know what it was at first. And all that shaking came as a shock to everyone, especially since earthquakes don't happen a lot around here. At first I didn't know what it was whenever it started and then all of a sudden the house started really shaking and then it went away and everybody kept asking what do you think that was? I said it had to have been an earthquake. At first I was kind of like what was that because I moved and it moved with me so I was like I didn't make it move like that and I looked and everything was just moving there for a while and it kind of got me a little lightheaded but it kind of caught me off guard. That's not to say there haven't been earthquakes out here before though and people have felt those ones before as well. Only one other time I was at Slotsky's in the drive through in my car and I start shaking back and forth I'm thinking what's wrong with my car? <laughs> I think it was the strongest one we felt to this day since I've been here because of the way it felt, because I haven't felt my bed move like that or seen the fans in the house move, stuff like that, like that before. But everyone can also agree that they hope that this is the last one they feel for a long time. I hope we don't ever have a big one next time. I mean, I just hope that was probably the biggest we'll ever have is what I'm hoping. I hope it keeps continuing the way it is where it's not uh, making any kind of holes or anything or, but I hope nothing major. Yesterday's 5.1 earthquake was the sixth largest quake in Texas history. Southern California is seeing a record breaking year for the number of earthquakes. Dozens of aftershocks felt throughout the coast to inland communities in just the past couple of days following the 4.7 earthquake that struck Malibu Thursday. Experts say since the year started, we've had around 13,000 earthquakes in California. Sometimes we feel them, sometimes we don't. And this past Thursday, many felt that the one that struck Southern California as it was a strong one. We've had a number of earthquakes for 
since the beginning of the year. No kidding. In fact, a record-breaking number, according to Robert DeGroote, Shake Alert Operations Team Lead for the U.S. Geological Survey. DeGroote says earthquakes happen more often than we feel them. We have an order of 20 to 30 earthquakes a day in Southern California on the order of 50 earthquakes a day in the state. Take a look at Earthquake Alert's Twitter page based on the USGS data. It reports each time an earthquake hits worldwide. The page is constantly updating with new rattles. This year, we're seeing a record-breaking number of quakes in California. DeGroote says since the year started, we've had 14 of them with a magnitude of four or higher. The average for this time of year, around eight. The latest one felt by millions in Los Angeles, followed by a number of aftershocks. Meanwhile, more breaking news out of Malibu this time. A 3.6 earthquake hit the area around 4.22 this morning. No word on any damage or injuries, but it comes after last week's 4.7 earthquake, which had several aftershocks that came after it. Isaiah 24, 19 through 21. The earth is violently broken. The earth is split open. The earth is shaken exceedingly. The earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard, and shall totter like a hut. Its transgression shall be heavy upon it, and it will fall, and not rise again. It shall come to pass in that day that the Lord will punish on high the host of exalted ones, and on the earth the kings of the earth. Luke 21, 26-28 Men's hearts failing them from fear, and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man, coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads, because your redemption draws near. The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now, and the evidence is so clear, that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world, as we know it, is near. For God so loved the world, that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For all have sinned, and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. These are the ABCs of salvation. A. Admit that you're a sinner. B. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and God raised him from the dead. C. Call upon the name of the Lord, and you will be saved. Jesus paid the price for mankind's sin. He has provided a way to spend eternity with Him and the Father. All you have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved. God has already done all the work. All you must do is receive, in faith, the salvation God offers. Fully trust in Jesus alone as the payment for your sins. Believe in Him, and you will not perish. God is offering you salvation as a gift. All you have to do is accept it. Jesus is the only way of salvation. That being said, we must repent of our sins. While repentance is not a work that earns salvation, repentance unto salvation does result in works. It is impossible to truly and fully change your mind without that causing a change in action. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. Repentance, properly defined, is necessary for salvation. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church. You may be at work. You may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what? Appearance occurs on a Sunday morning. My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready! Get ready! is short. Call upon the name of Jesus today.